Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 2021 Legislative Update. I'm Liz Blose, the Executive Director for the Pocono Chamber of Commerce. Thank you all for tuning in. Please grab some coffee or a snack and get comfortable. We have an exciting hour ahead of us with many important updates coming your way provided by your state senators and representatives. We are so pleased to bring this virtual experience right to the comfort of your home or office. If you don't already, please be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube to stay up to date on all things Chamber. Please be mindful that you have been muted by our host today so no one can see or hear you at the moment. However, we do encourage you to participate in the chat box as well as the Q&A box. In just a bit, we'll be hearing from a few of Monroe County's top leaders. These legislators work tirelessly to be a voice for Monroe County at the state level. They are all key players in bringing positive change to the residents of our county, and we appreciate them taking the time out of their very busy schedules to join us here today. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to turn it over to the amazing Ari Luna Grace Van Spoten. If you are able, we ask that you please rise for the national anthem. Oh, say can you sing by the dawn's early light? What so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stores through the perilous fright oh the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star spangled banner yet wave oh the That was absolutely magical. It is now my pleasure to thank our amazing community partners. Because of their support, the Chamber is able to continue to provide relevant and important updates to our community, both in person and virtually. You'll be hearing from a few of them in just a bit. Thank you to our presenting sponsors today, St. Luke's University Health Network, Lehigh Valley Hospital Pocono, PPL Electric Utilities. Each of these presenting sponsors will be providing important updates on all they have done for our community throughout today's program, and we can't wait to hear from them. Thank you to, your, to our Silver Spotlight sponsor, the Pocono Mountains Association of Realtors, the voice of real estate in the Poconos. Shout out to Nicole Murray and her amazing team tuning in today. Thank you to our Silver Spotlight sponsor, Pennsylvania Career Link of Monroe County, the primary source of excellence in workforce development in the Pocono communities. Their team is ready to assist you in your recruitment and training needs. And have you seen those amazing billboards out there? Shout out to our bronze spotlight sponsor, Adams Outdoor Advertising, for helping us get the word out to the community about today's event. And ready or not, it's tax season. But don't worry, our bronze spotlight sponsor, ROB Accountants, has got you covered. Reach out to Philip Pope and his team today to set up a consultation. And of course, thank you to our amazing community partner and bronze spotlight sponsor, the Pocono Mountains Economic Development Corporation, who will be officially starting to accept applications from Monroe County businesses this Monday, March 1st, for the COVID-19 Hospitality Industry Recovery Program. The program guidelines and application package can be found on their website, and the link will be included for you in today's event recap email. Last but not least, Thank you to our proud partners, the Greater Lehigh Valley Chamber of Commerce and the Pocono Mountain Visitors Bureau for their support on all our Chamber's initiatives. So without further ado, please welcome Don Seipel, 
president of St. Luke's University Health Network, Monroe Campus. Morning, thanks, Michael. Um, it's my pleasure this morning to be uh, to join the chamber. You know, I'm going to focus my message today on COVID because it, it really has impacted all of us over this past year, and I continue to receive many questions on a regular basis. Back in March, the Pope was one of the region's first, uh, one of the first regions in the country to be severely impacted by COVID. Case counts and hospitalizations were high. Over the summer, we experienced a brief reprieve, although it didn't go away. As fall faded away in November, COVID cases rose sharply, as did hospitalization. Much has been learned over the past year about COVID. Because of this, patient outcomes have improved dramatically, but there is much we still don't know about COVID. And as such, there are still many people that suffer long lasting side effects and even worse, are still dying from this terrible virus. There are two options that we have in the fight against COVID that I'd like to highlight this morning. In fact, recently St. Luke celebrated milestones for both. The first of which was administering our 100,000th dose of the COVID vaccine. There have been many questions about the vaccine. Should I get it? When can I get it? Where can I get it? As you may have read recently, uh, in the news, Pennsylvania has one of the lowest vaccination rates in the nation. And unfortunately, Monroe County's vaccination rate is in the bottom 10% of the Pennsylvania counties. Our legislators, Representative Brown and Madden and Congresswoman Wild have been advocating on our behalf of Monroe County residents to get more vaccine. Right now, there just isn't enough vaccine to meet the demand. But I ask you all to be patient this will resolve over time as more vaccine is manufactured and distributed. I'll tell you, we, uh, we struggle um, on a daily basis. People are just really frustrated. I can't emphasize the, the need to be patient. That being said, Monroe County hasn't received its fair share of vaccine. The health systems in Monroe County have, system, have put systems in place to register, schedule, and receive their vaccine to receive a vaccine. We are ready and eager to move forward on a large scale to vaccinate our residents. We just need vaccine. St. Luke's currently is able to vaccinate over 3,000 people daily at our 11 hospital-based sites across our area with the ability to scale up from there. Recently, we, we introduced the shot line for seniors. As we've heard many seniors don't have access to the internet uh, or have a computer. The shot line is an automated scheduling system that will allow individuals to self-schedule their appointments over the phone. If you're an existing St. Luke's patient who has, who has not been vaccinated and are eligible, according to the Pennsylvania Department of Health guidelines, you'll receive a call uh, on the, with the phone number that you have listed on your patient record. During the call, an automated system will ask if you would like to receive the vaccine and step you through a process of scheduling the vaccine. People can also sign up online through my chart. If you're not an existing patient, you can create an account and register for the vaccine. Again, based on your eligibility, you'll be, you will be notified when you can schedule your vaccination. The second milestone we, are, we recently celebrated was administering our 1,000th monoclonal antibody treatment this past week. In November, St. Luke's became the first provi healthcare provider in Pennsylvania to offer monoclonal uh, antibody therapy in an outpatient setting. The first clinic opened at our St. Luke's Eastern, Eastern campus, followed shortly thereafter by a second clinic at our St. Luke's Warren campus in Phillipsburg, New Jersey, and just recently, our St. Luke's Miners campus opened our third monoclonal antibody clinic, the only facility in rural Schuylkill County. Offering the monoclonal treatment was an important in many ways. We relieved the pressure off of all of the area hospitals during the height of the recent surge. 
We offer this treatment because it's the right thing to do for our patients and our community. However, by offering this treatment, we have significantly reduced healthcare expenses, which transit in, into savings for our patients, our, our employer community, health plans, and the avoidance of costly admissions and possibly readmissions. In addition to treatments like this, this one, we have thousands of employees working tirelessly to vaccinate as many of our community as possible. I would like to give them a brief, uh, I would like to give a, a brief update on, on our, our network's progress as, I, as I've stated earlier. So today, since, since vaccinating our 100,000th, we've now exceeded 110,000 doses of vaccine. We, we continue to vaccinate people as quickly as possible depending on availability of vaccine from our state. Due to the significant statewide shortage of Moderna vaccines that have been promised to hospitals and other providers, St. Luke's was forced to reschedule a number of vaccines appointments this week. Individuals, individuals who were impacted were contacted directly by us and offered a new date and time for their appointment. We tried to minimize the the scheduling, uh, the rescheduling uh, to result in the, the least amount of impact to those patients. The good news is anyone receiving the booster is being scheduled within the 42 day window of receiving the Moderna booster per the FTA guidelines. We have not seen any significant issues with the reduced shipments of Pfizer requests. I want to remind everyone that that vaccine is being offered free of charge and vaccines are on bus routes. We continue to focus on educating the public on the vaccine safety and efficacy. When the vaccine is available to you, please consider receiving it. It's the only way we will begin to return to normalcy. Finally, the best thing you can do, again, is to pre-register to get notified when you are when you are able to be scheduled for the vaccine by filling out a questionnaire uh, on St. Luke's My Chart at sluhn.org forward slash vaccine. This webpage is a great resource. It contains valuable information, FAQs, and links to My Chart for new and, and existing patients. Thank you for your time this morning. Thank you so much, Don, and the entire St. Luke's team for helping us bring today's event to life. Now, please enjoy this video courtesy of St. Luke's University Health Network, Monroe Campus. Medical emergencies can and do happen during COVID-19. One American has a heart attack or stroke every 40 seconds. And one American dies from stroke every four minutes. Heart attacks and strokes will not wait until a pandemic runs its course. It is not safe to sit home and hope the symptoms pass. It is safe to come to St. Luke's. Our EMS crews and ambulances are ready for you, taking every measure to keep you safe. It is now my pleasure to turn the presentation over to the Senator Mary Scavello, who serves our community covering the 40th, 40th Senatorial District. Scavello, the floor is yours. What we've been doing, especially in this past um, pandemic season, the last two years here, has been very, very difficult on small businesses. But you guys have been out there in the trenches and uh, truly appreciate what you've done. Um, let me start with, on February 3rd, the governor unveiled the proposed $40.2 billion general fund budget for fiscal year 2021-22, which includes a $3.1 billion and 8.2% increase in state spending, a substantial income tax rate hike as well to 449. It concerns me that 8.2% increase in spending does not match the current economic climate in Pennsylvania. And in 2020, Pennsylvania had the highest number of unemployment claims in the county, in the country, excuse me. Nothing to brag about. However, these are real concerns that need to be addressed. And we've not reached the end of the, pand of the pandemic. On top of the historic unemployment numbers, the governor's plan to increase the PIT, which places the burdens on the workers and especially small business on top of that, a permanent job loss for many companies, individuals, and industries. Throughout, that common, throughout the Commonwealth. 
The IFO, Independent Fiscal Office, is projecting that this pandemic will take six years to return to economic status prior to COVID. While the go governor is calling for a large increase in spending, he's planning to cut $5 million in funding for broadband, even though the funding is mandated by Act 132 of 2020. Senate Bill 835 as well has millions of dollars for healthcare services and agriculture. I, you know, I want to commend the hospitals and the job they've been doing and everybody during the pandemic, but I also uh, want to make a, a correction. Um, I've been on the phone with the secretary, the, the new deputy secretary of uh, health on the distribution of COVID to our area. I found out from Dr. Deglin, I did make a call into um, um, Don, into you and did not get a response. But um, just want you to know that, the, especially when both you and uh, Lehigh Valley, the uh, numbers were, were reduced dramatically, or, or none at all, basically. I was on the phone and she'll be coming in front of me because we have to vote for her appointment in the Senate. And um, I, I made it clear that if she doesn't correct, the secretary doesn't correct the, the issue in Monroe, she will not get my vote in caucus in the committee. Assisting businesses and residents in communities across Pennsylvania, we've done, we've passed numerous bills and I know I'm very happy to hear that the, uh, that the, uh, this is gonna be happening soon here at the chamber and, uh, and, and um, those dollars will get out to, to the small businesses and their, their grants from 5,000 to 50,000 I know it's not enough because many of you suffered dramatic hurts, especially in the in the restaurant and, and tavern area and our, our our resorts, the big resorts that we that we've lost. Look, I, I just want everyone to know that I've been very very uh, uh, complimentary to the governor until this past year. Um, I worked with his budgets. I commended on his his budgets. I just this. The closures were, I think, a little more than needed and still are. Um, and that's what puts the, the burden on our, um, on, our, on our area and economic impact in our area. We've lost a tremendous amount of jobs. And you said number, number one was in Pennsylvania, but, but per percentage-wise, Monroe got hit the hardest because of the tourism industry. It really took a heavy hit. When you close three water parks, and a casino, the generation, those people that are generated in those areas, that come to those areas, also buy gas, also shop in our, go to our restaurants, also go elsewhere. So we really took it, we took it uh, tough. And then the last three months, the th last three weeks of um, this uh, December into January 4th, the three busiest weeks of the year, and the, we close our water parks. You know, they deal with chlorine there. You know, when you step into that park, you're disinfected, no matter what you touch. Uh, they have, they've had no, no major issues, but yet we closed them, you know, and unfortunately um, it took a, it, it's, it's taken a hit on our, on our economy here in, in, in Monroe County. Um, I'd like to also talk about the census because to me, um, it's, it was very, very important. And unfortunately, um, you know, um, we're starting to go after the census was taken because because of uh, COVID-19 there's an escape from New York to, to our area, uh, to uh, Pike County, Monroe. And I see it also in, in the 40th Senate District in Northampton County, in the upper part of the county that we've had the growth as well coming in. But those numbers don't get counted for another 10 years. And so we lose out on that. And the importance of it is because we get funded federal funding for every person counted. And, and these folks have come in after the census. We're happy to have them, don't, don't get me wrong, but it's just a, a streak of bad luck. If it happened a year earlier, we would have, we would have been, uh, had the benefit of having those counted. Um, I project we're gonna lose a congressional seat. We have, the, the state has been growing, but it's not growing at the rate of other states. So we're going to definitely lose a, co a congressional street, street excuse me. Um, and on top of that, we, our districts will probably have to 
shrink a little bit. Um, my, my Senate district's approximately about 5,000 more, I'm projecting uh, people than initially. And so I probably would lose about 5,000. Where I lose it from, I'm not sure. I believe that the three house seats also have grown. And so it can mean one thing. It could mean another state rep from another, from maybe from Carbon or someone else from another area, pick up a couple of municipalities within Monroe. But um, that's still too early. I know that, um, that the um, majority leader and the pro tempore of the Senate are putting and speaking to the house There'll be two minority and two majority from the House and Senate on a group, and then they have to get together and pick up uh, the fifth person. If they can't come to a consensus, that person that's picked uh, will be picked by the court. And so those five will, will basically put together, try to put together a redistricting plan. My concern is with it delayed, I don't want that plan rushed. I want to make sure that we get uh, proper representation. And, and if it means waiting a little bit longer, waiting another year, I have no problem with that because I don't want to see it rush. I think the federal government needs to get, get it to us as quick as possible. If we don't get it soon, uh, this, I, I have a concern that we won't be ready for the primary next year. The, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm now the chair of policy in the Senate. One of the first things that I'm going to do is I'm going to have a hearing on waivers and how they were handed out uh, the, 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 with the closures. And I want, I'm going to have a hearing on the effect um, of, in our Commonwealth, the, the, the negative impact, uh, negative economic impact in our Commonwealth, what it's cost us. I think it's important to know those numbers. Um, and I know uh, Chris Barrett is going to um, be one of the uh, gentlemen that's going to be speaking at the at the forum. So we're looking we're looking for um, uh, a, a good turnout, and hopefully it'll open up our eyes to see where where we need to um, where we need to go and who, who to help. Um, the other thing I'd like to talk about: we've had numerous road projects and uh, going on, and uh, and uh, and scheduled in the, in the pipe. And one of the, one of the ones finally finished was the 611, the Scott Run to Swiftwater. I think they did a very good job. I have a little concern around the Mikos with that setup there, but for the most part, that wide center shoulder from, from Scott Run all the way up to Swiftwater has been working. There's been no congestion. And I haven't seen a, an accident at all since we've uh, uh, put that, uh, that new road in. Um, we also did uh, the, met the, uh, his the metal bridge there in East Stroudsburg was just completed. And that bridge was really in bad shape. We've heard about it for many years. I want to thank the county uh, uh, because they were part of it. The solution, that bridge was owned by, according to the PUC, by the municipality, by the railroad, by the county, um, and uh, and a piece of it was the, was the uh, PennDOT. And so we, we said, why, why you know, uh, doesn't PennDOT own the bridge? And we got them to take it over. But in order for that to happen, the county and the municipality put some dollars up for the engineering. And then we, got the, and then we were able to get the county to take the bridge over. And with the, we got a, a safe bridge there now, wide, that you can see when you're stepping out. You don't need the use of the mirror when you're driving to make a left-hand turn on both sides, so um, that's done. The next step is gonna be, and the reason why we had to do that bridge first is more construction going on. The uh, bridge over I-80 in East Stroudsburg is gonna be replaced and the road's gonna be widened below. That's a danger, to try to get onto I-80 there in East Stroudsburg is very dangerous. You, you almost have to be able to stop to, to be able to look back um, to see oncoming cars in order for you to, enter the highway. So that bridge is next. It's um, probably sometime this year, they're gonna be breaking ground. 447 and 209, which has been the, I call it the toughest left-hand turn in the county trying to make. And when you do that turn, you, when you're waiting to make that turn, you, you're backing up traffic tremendously. So that we, with the project, with, with the Jim DePresta's pro, pro, uh, project there, that roadway is going to be widened with turning lanes, 
uh, and there'll be another road, an interior road. So if you're on 209 going out to 447, you don't have to stay on and go up to the light. You can make a right with inside that, the interior of that development and, and show up almost facing the accelerator there, the ESU accelerator on the other side. Um, the, we also have two other projects, the uh, I-80, 715, 611 project. We're just about ready to uh, take it to, to, to bid. And that project is going to really make 715 so much safer. It's a, it's a narrow road. It's gonna get widened with turning lanes. Um, and the 611, where the backup is at 715 and 611, there's always a backup. We're going to go through the mountain where you see the welcome to Tannersville sign. There's gonna be a four way there and we're gonna get rid of that other signal those two signals are too close to each other. And when by being so close, you're catching that light twice and you're back in traffic, especially on the weekends, on a Friday night, Saturday, and on a Sunday night, going back in the opposite direction, it backs like beyond Billy's Diner to go through that intersection. I, it's long time needed. I never, whenever I see signals that close, I, you, I always think of Mount Pocono and the effect that it had on Mount Pocono. And in the old days, they did it. We, we just, uh, uh, maybe back in the old days, they didn't have, they didn't have, well, they definitely didn't have the track we have today. But getting rid of that signal will make uh, that, that 611 traffic flow smoothly. Another project, 380 and 940, we're widening 380 and 940. Uh, there's going to be natural gas, water. And unfortunately, you got to wait for permit. The per permitting process takes so long. And we're taking the, uh, the 380 exit onto 940, um, and we're bringing it over to Long Pond Ro Road, basically, and we're matching. So right now, when you get off at 380, there's no signal, and you're making a left through a four-lane road. It's very, very difficult and very dangerous because you, sometimes vehicles coming over that bridge don't see you till the last minute, the overpass, they don't see you till the last minute. So... That is another project that uh, I believe is, is going to really make it safer. And that's been the concern, make our roads safer and make, the, make them flow uh, smoothly. I, I want to, again, uh, th thank everyone, thank the hospitals and thank all of you at the chamber. And I want to also uh, uh, thank the, uh, the people behind the scenes, the, the uh, health workers, uh, the the folks, the, the, our police departments, the nurses, the um, um, ambulance people, the people that pick, you know, they go into these homes and, and take folks back. It's been a tough time, but I, I just want you all to know that uh, we all appreciate the work that you do and maybe we don't say enough. Thank you very much and have a, a blessed day and I'll, I'll wait for the questions later. Thank you. Thank you so much, Senator, and thank you to your team. Um, they're extremely helpful for making this happen today. Um, thank you for joining us as well. Unfortunately, Senator John Blake was unexpectedly not able to join us this morning. However, we will be providing some updates from Senator Blake in the event recap email. Well, with that being said, please welcome Steve Cunningham, Vice President of Market Development for Lehigh Valley Hospital Pocono. Thank you to the entire LVHN Pocono team for their continued chamber support. Thank you, Michael. Lehigh Valley Hospital Pocono was pleased to be able to be a sponsor for the event today. Uh, having attended this event for many years, I recognize that you're, he you're here to hear from our uh, legislators. And so I'll keep my remarks brief. Uh, can't talk about healthcare without addressing COVID. And I don't want to be redundant with what uh, Don already shared with you this morning. And I very much support the message that he provided. Uh, there is a lot of frustration with not being able to have adequate supplies of vaccine to serve our community. Uh, we are working with uh, legislators in order to improve upon that and expect that in the coming weeks uh, for the reasons of existing manufacturers, Pfizer, Moderna, uh, increasing their uh, production capability, improved logistics. But also I wanted to speak about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. We've had, a, I have received a lot of questions about that and 
uh, about some of the differences. And so I'll just share a little bit of the information. We know that uh, there's some expectation that it may come out of committee with approval at, uh, today. And uh, there are some differences with the vaccine. And I wanted to highlight a couple of those. The refrigeration, uh, as opposed to having to freeze the Moderna and Pfizer, uh, this is going to enable rural areas to, uh, I believe, find it easier logistically to receive the supply. Uh, now there's questions about what is the efficacy? And we know that the Pfizer and Moderna are in the 94, 95%. Uh, the Johnson & Johnson is a single dose, so that in and of itself is a significant advantage in trying to vaccinate a significant population. The efficacy is about 85% to prevent significant um, uh, COVID event. Now, in terms of a more moderate and lower uh, virus, it's closer to the 60s. That said, if we contrast that with flu vaccines that we've been very familiar with over a number of years, flu vaccines are 50 to 60% effective. And so even for uh, uh, the Johnson & Johnson comparison, it's up to 85% for the most significant impact of the virus and for moderate closer to the 60s. So it is still very strong. Um, in terms of uh, expectations of when we will see that, uh, obviously, again, with the caveat that it's going to be approved by the FDA, uh, the company says it plans to deliver 20 million doses by late March. Uh, and uh, that is in line with an agreement to supply the United States with 100 million doses by the end of June. And they are ready to begin distributing next week uh, at 3 million doses. So help is on the way. And despite the frustrations that Don indicated, we ask for patience. Like St. Luke's, Lehigh Valley also has the ability to create an account uh, online at mylvhn.org. Uh, and you will, upon registering, be contacted when your category is uh, available uh, and appointments are available. And also, as was pointed out earlier, uh, if individuals struggle with registering on uh, the website, we do have phone numbers that you will find uh, where we will help you, as well as you can schedule your appointment uh, by phone. So we're working diligently uh, with other healthcare systems to try to get this vaccine to the population as soon as possible. Another impact of the pandemic that we have seen, and I know when speaking with colleagues across other health networks, is the issue of patients not seeking care due to fears of contracting COVID. And as Don had indicated, uh, we are safe. We have the latest safety protocols that are in place. And individuals that are not seeking care have sadly experienced significant health issues because strokes, cardiac events, cancer, delays in receiving needed care for those in other conditions may result in irreversible uh, results. And so please make sure that when someone is experiencing some type of a healthcare event, don't delay because of concerns about COVID. Uh, I'll use that to segue into a couple of comments about non-COVID at Lehigh Valley, uh, Pocono. Uh, we have a new medical director for the Ho Monroe County Hospice House, Dr. Christopher Behrman. Uh, has joined us and Dr. Behrman is trained in palliative and hospice medicine. Uh, we're very pleased to have him to join the great team at the hospice house. Endocrinology is another area where we have seen great demand and we're pleased that we have a new endocrinologist, Dr. Diana Bacal, that has joined us. 
And certainly oncology uh, is an area that we are, uh, given the high incidence of uh, cancer in our area, uh, at the Dale and Francis Hughes Cancer Center, we're very pleased that we've been able to recruit new medical oncologist, uh, Dr. Bhavana Singh, a new radiation oncologist, Dr. Nabori. And we're also updating technology at the Cancer Center with a new CT simulator. In the Heart Institute, we have increased the number of providers on our staff and also making technology upgrades in the very near future for two new cath labs. Uh, but this program is one we're very proud of, continue to develop uh, and bring new providers into the market uh, in CT surgery, cardiology, uh, and they enable us to provide high-risk cardiac caths, electrophysiology, and ECMO. We just recently uh, opened up two new pediatric offices uh, in East Stroudsburg at uh, the 447 Plaza. We're very pleased these pediatric practices have their roots uh, going back into the 1990s to serve the uh, significant population growth at the time and low-income population in the case of our dental center, as well as all patients in, in pediatrics. So we, uh, despite much of the conversation being focused on the pandemic and COVID-19, uh, there are new programs, new providers, new technology that we're very pleased that we're able to offer our community here at Lehigh Valley Hospital Pocono. So thank you for the opportunity to share a few remarks and look forward to the rest of the program. Have a great day. Thank you, Steve. Now please enjoy this video courtesy of Lehigh Valley Hospital Pocono. I never expected that was my heart. It's a very technical operation. It's an open heart. You know, it's, we're in the Poconos. So the fact that you guys saved my wife's life, which is amazing. In healthcare, we've shown many, many times that if you have a caring partner, it's a lot easier. When we had the need, you guys answered the call. I would now like to welcome State Representative Rosemary Brown serving the 189th Legislative District. Okay, I was actually going to put my video on if you'd like, but um, I don't think it will let me do it unless you authorize it. But hopefully you can at least hear me. We can, can absolutely hear, hear, we can absolutely hear you, Representative Rosemary Brown, and feel free if you'd like to turn on your camera. Okay, thanks. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm trying to, but it says the host has disabled it. So it's okay if um, either which way, but I, I was wanted to say hello, everyone, and see the face. And um, I, I wish I could see everyone else's faces for this meeting. Um, thank you, first of all, St. Luke's Lehigh Valley Health Network, the chamber, um, for pulling this together. Uh, if you could see in front of me, I have notes everywhere. There's so much happening and so much that's important to everyone. And um, okay, so here's my video. Let's see um, if it came up, I don't know. But um, it, there's so much happening. And I have to tell you, um, yesterday I've been in appropriations hearings all week and um, we had all the secretaries being questioned. And yesterday was the uh, Secretary of Health, the Acting Secretary, Secretary Beam, um, really uh, received a lot of questions in regards to COVID and the vaccine. And, you know, St. Luke's Lehigh Valley Health Network have done an excellent job. Uh, if you know anybody that has gone in for their vaccine, it has been very smooth, it has been quick, it's been organized, you know, once you're able to uh, get registered. Uh, but the issue from the state level is um, there was such a disappointment on the distribution plan and the allocations um, that really we had almost over a year here. We knew the vaccine was eventually going to come, um, but the distribution plan was very poorly done and very unorganized. Um, the hospital systems were, I, I tell you, amazed how well they functioned with 
no communication. Um, I mentioned yesterday on the House floor that, uh, you know, with, with a notice of a pending status that they were getting a shipment the next day. And uh, it's very difficult to function that way to be able to offer customer service and patient care under those provisions. Um, so I do believe uh, this new acting secretary beam is um, really trying to improve everything. Obviously the supplies are going to improve. Um, one of the other points that I think is important for the public to know is that um, 1A, the phase of that expansion, you know, to which originally we started with 75 plus for the vaccine and then it was expanded based on CDC recommendations. Um, but when Pennsylvania expanded it, and, and, and followed that, um, they set up the expectations for the public to say, well, okay, I'm in 1A now, I'll be able to get this vaccine. It was just sort of the way it was communicated, the way that the public would expect it. And that wasn't the case. There, there, you know, you still had trying to get the frontline workers and the 75 and up, and then it was expanded way too soon without the true communication to the public. So that, that really came up a lot. And um, we're really pushing for the honesty level of where we're at and the allocations as um, both healthcare systems mentioned to make sure that um, I had questioned the metrics of how these doses are, are uh, doled out among the counties. So um, we're really on top of that. So just to let you all know, um, but, but our health systems, we're very lucky to have them um, and they are working under great stress for a very long period of time. So, um, I also wanted to just uh, give you a quick update that my, uh, since every two years it changes based on when we're elected, my committees uh, currently are appropriations, transportation, education, and um, sort of um, the special education uh, chairwoman for education, uh, professional licensure, and I'm also the deputy chairwoman for policy committee on the House side for the majority house. Um, so those are my newest committees. Um, I'm going to just touch base real quick with some of my legislative work. Obviously, we are always focused on school property tax reform, very difficult subject. Um, that's, that's one thing that, you know, kind of moves in different directions as we try to figure out ways that we can get some of that reform done. Um, in the governor's budget, um, he does uh, offer a PIT increase, which is very concerning to me. And I also uh, did mention that to our Secretary of Revenue, uh, when you're trying to increase the personal income tax during a pandemic, um, I personally don't believe, and I don't believe it's good economics to do that for uh, the people of Pennsylvania, especially when everyone is on shaky ground um, or possibly don't know what the future may bring with their jobs or their employment. Um, while I can appreciate his efforts to, um, he's, he's saying to raise the PIT um, and give the, the, get the formula for each school district uh, fixed. And I do appreciate that because that's something I support, but not with a PIT that is raised to Pennsylvanians at this time. And there is no guarantee of any sort of school property tax relief with it, uh, no millage reductions guaranteed. Um, and that's concerning because you could have a PIT increase and we could still have the extremely high school property tax rates at the same time. So um, that's something obviously school tax reform is always on the list. You'll see many of you, um, this is my, I think third session with hands-free driving, enhanced driver responsibility legislation. Um, all of you business people, don't worry. You can still utilize your phone while driving, just hands-free Bluetooth technology. And um, again, just trying to uh, change driver behavior, uh, reduce texting driving and saying, listen, focus on the road and um, just trying to help in any way we can to reduce the distractions. Um, you probably know you see people all the time, you know, right in front of them and a police officer can't do anything to pull them over. Um, again, it's a reasonable fine, but it is a very, very serious problem with our drivers and the safety of our roads. So you'll see me pushing that a lot. Um, it should be coming out of the transportation committee. Um, in the next couple weeks. Also, you'll see a lot of initiatives from me uh, with, uh, we have some realtors on the line and some people that are involved with the private homeowner associations communities. I'm definitely a strong advocate for helping them function better and to be able to, um, 
you know, have less chaos within there and, and show how educate the uh, board members. And um, I'm doing some legislation with um, homeowner association voting reform so that people that live within private communities can feel confident about their election process, that they feel that um, there has been some cases within our uh, district here and with the Poconos with, with um, the homeowners association saying that they did not trust their voting systems for their board members. We have a, a case in Pike County through the courts right now. So, you know, we want to make sure people have the confidence within the homeowners association and still let them function as a private entity. Um, you'll also see first time home buyers legislation, which is, um, you know, great right now. Thank goodness our, our real estate market is very good. Uh, but one of the big obstacles to owning a home is the down payment, especially with young, um, you know, student debt and everything else that's, that's um, giving people a harder time to save for that. Uh, financial literacy, you've seen me over the years. We finally got that in for children who are um, graduating from high school, making sure they have the basic skills of everyday life uh, that actually went into law uh, last year. And it does allow that coursework to count as a graduation requirement. So hopefully encouraging, incentivizing, and showing the importance of taking that coursework uh, before they graduate from high school. So those are a couple of my initiatives. The other thing I wanted to bring to your attention is I've also, with our COVID situation, um, the difficult measures that we have and then different households having to deal with, with different situations, financials, depression, um, the kids home from school, there's a lot happening, loss of jobs, our unemployment system has been very, very tough on people. Um, it has not been functioning appropriately, it's overwhelmed. Um, I've started a neighbor to neighbor initiative and um, that's basically a letter that I have sent out to our local leaders, townships, boroughs, uh, school boards and our private homeowner association communities to uh, put this on their agenda and that I would work with them to try to really help and identify people that they are closest to. You know, the, when you get to the local government level, you get the closest to the people. You know, I'm the closest state elected official to the people, but, but we can get even closer to the people with our local leaders. And that's what I'm trying to do and trying to initiate and, and help them put on their agenda to develop a volunteer program or some sort of initiative within their um, jurisdiction that would locate and identify seniors or families or unusual situations where neighbors to neighbors can help each other and pay attention to each other. We've got some great responses so far, but just wanted to put that out and let you know that that's something that I'm working on. Um, the other quick couple things is, you know, I've heard a lot about from people, well, how can all these decisions keep happening um, without the legislative input uh, at the state level? And it all goes back to the uh, Disaster Emergency Declaration Authority of the governor. Um, we did push some pressure on the governor to, uh, the, to the process um, and, and said to the courts, we have the right to remove the legislative body, to remove the disaster declaration, um, to make sure that we're were involved in the process, but the courts said we didn't. So the governor still has the authority to um, extend the disaster emergency declaration. And when that happens, he still has the authority to do executive orders and executive health orders. And of course, anybody listening, I have absolutely been um, on board with protecting health and smart and common sense. Um, and especially in the beginning, I, I think the governor, you know, you have to work quickly and you have to make decisions. And, um, you know, but, but as you get more control and, and can understand more what you're dealing with, you must bring the legislative process back in. And um, it has been very obvious that the legislators have been pulled out of the process. And when, my, when I'm pulled out of the process, I'm your voice. So then your voice is pulled out of the process. Um, so this is a serious concern for me just on the way government should function. Um, and so I hope that we, we start to have a little bit more um, of our normal process coming back into play. Um, but that is why uh, the governor can make the decisions that he makes without our input and without us um, you know, being involved. So um, the other thing is, and then that goes down to certain businesses. We talk about the hospitality. Um, you know, why, why shutdowns, why, you know, serving drinks after a certain point, all these decisions 
that many of our business owners and many of, of the public say, this doesn't make sense, or this is not common sense. Rosemary, can't you do something? Can't you help? I'm trying. I'm trying. Um, but when you can't have that legislative input and that guidance um, brought into the process, and it's just um, an executive branch making all the decisions, it becomes very dangerous, and it's not helpful for a very difficult situation. It should not be politics. It definitely should be productivity. So um, that's a couple things. I will tell you the, the CARES dollars have been very helpful from the federal government, as many of you know. Um, we had a lot to help small business. We currently have the hospitality uh, grant program that's active. I know Chuck Leonard and Michelle are on this call. God bless them. They're going to be taking those grant applications for the Monroe County level. Um, obviously, 300 employees or less. Um, usually a 25% reduction in revenue is needed. And most of the grants are given out in 5,000 to $50,000 in, you know, with a $50,000 max. Um, but again, priority giving given to those businesses that really have been affected by the governor's shutdown. You also should know there's um, rental assistance and a utility program that have come through as well. So um, that's, again, dollars that we have passed through the legislative body. So that is something to help people who are really struggling. And um, that's it. That's it. But there's a lot more. I have notes everywhere. Like I said, if uh, anyone needs me, please um, feel free to always reach out. And I know my chief of staff, Mackenzie Strunk, is on this call as well. And you can reach her at my office, too, if you should need anything. So thanks so much, everyone. I know we have over 100 people on this call. Appreciate you taking the time out of your morning. Thanks so much. Thank you, Representative Rosemary Brown, and shout out to Mackenzie Strunk for her amazing, incredible work she does for you. And with that, please welcome State Representative Maureen Madden, serving the 115th Legislative District. Hi, good morning, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here remotely. Um, I do miss the breakfast, however, I'm not going to lie. Um, since we are starting with COVID, I, um, I think I'd like to make a couple of comments about that. First of all, I would like to thank our um, partners in the um, medical field, St. Luke's and um, Lehigh Valley Network. I know that you all have um, really just informed the community and moved mountains to do more with little. Uh, you've streamlined the processes to make getting tested for COVID or getting the vaccine um, as, as um, streamlined and as accommodating as possible. I know that um, in particular, it has been my pleasure to work with Don Seipel to try to get folks vaccinated. Um, some of our senior apartment complexes um, fell through the cracks because they didn't have long, um, they, don't, they weren't licensed or long-term skilled facilities. Uh, so they weren't part of the community partnership. And I know that Don and um, Monroe County Transit Authority worked very closely with uh, Lisa Flory, the manager of Shirley Futch. And we are happy to report we will be providing transportation and also um, Doc Martinelli, the mayor of East Stroudsburg, has also been working with us, and we're um, happy to announce that we have made arrangements for those folks to get um, vaccinated, and the transportation will be provided, and the folks at St. Luke's will be helping them, um, you know, get in and watching over them for the 15 minutes that they have to make sure that they don't have a reaction. So I'm so grateful to our family partners, and I would like to say in the last month or so, I've had the um, opportunity to be both in St. Luke's Hospital and also Lehigh Valley Network. My husband had surgery uh, two weeks ago in Lehigh Valley Network for his rotator cuff. And um, he was, we were so impressed that despite, you know, the ongoing slot of coronavirus and how long you all have been dealing with this for over a year now, Everyone I encountered um, in the hospital, I had to go for blood work. My husband had to go for surgery. I'm amazed at how upbeat and how attentive and what good spirits everybody is, despite the fact that they have been working so hard for over a year and really have been um, essential frontline workers. And I'm sure that it, um, it is, um, it's indicative of the leadership 
and you know you see Don Seiple walking around the hospital and um, greeting his his um, employees and the people who come in and it's that kind of personal touch that we get from our, our partners in Lehigh Valley Network in St. Luke's that gets us through this, right? Um, we, we are, we're fighting the good fight and we have a little time left before we all, before we achieve herd immunity and before we get those vaccines from the federal government in a meaningful way that we can start having mass vaccination sites um, as commonplace and achieve that herd immunity so we can open up our restaurants at full capacity. We can start going to our water parks and start shopping in our local businesses um, without fear. Um, and possibly one day with seeing each other smiles without wearing a mask. So a big kudos and a big thank you to our partners um, at Lehigh Valley and St. Luke's. Also, uh, we cannot, cannot talk about essential workers and community partners without talking about the United Way of Monroe County and uh, the director, Michael Takiva, and the staff that he has assembled to be the really the first stop um, for any information about COVID and also Pocono um, Chamber of Commerce and the Pocono Mountain Visitors Bureau. They we've They've done such a good job. Our community partners have done such a good job with working with each other. So, you know, the Pocono Promise came out early with the Pocono Chamber of Commerce to make sure that we open up and that we, you know, enter the re winter resort season, um, you know, as um, safe as possible. And then the United Way did did um, a, a phenomenal job of dispersing the mortgage and rent relief in such a short amount of time. I believe Monroe County was one of the leaders in pushing that money out the door and getting it in the hands of renters and um, and homeowners. And we have new um, we have new um, legislation that has passed that will streamline that process and make it even easier. And there is more money being appropriated. And I'm sincerely hoping that the um, Pocono United Way of the Pocono Mountains or Pocono Mountains United Way um, does continue to work and disperse that money because I can tell you from my standpoint, once I referred someone to the United Way, they more often than not contacted me and said, how really helpful everybody was and how knowledgeable everybody was. And if we're going to see our communities through this challenge and through this recovery, we certainly have to do have all of our agencies um, that are tasked with helping and pushing out these funds and making sure that no one gets left behind. We wanna make sure that we assemble the best team. And um, in terms of our hospitality and our resorts and our workers, uh, again, Pocono Mountains United Way and um, the Pocono Chamber of Commerce stepped up with some private donors to raise money to give, you know, um, grants of $250, excuse me, $250 to um, our hospitality workers, and that was pretty successful. And then other, um, you know, local restaurants such as the Frogtown Chop House, they had funds as well for their employees. So. Um, and everybody, I was just really moved by the number of donations and the number of people who came out to um, to donate and make sure that our hospitality industry and the people who serve us were taken care of during the shutdown and during the pause. Um, it hasn't been easy and the line of communication hasn't always been the best, um, but I think overall, I think we've done well in Pennsylvania. When you look at the map on the news and you see, you know, the um, <clears throat> the states who are dealing with um, much, you know, I'm I'm trying to remember how the map is set. It's like 500,000 cases. It's one color, and we are never the worst, but we're not the best. We're right there in the middle. And I guess in a once in a century pandemic that's probably not a bad place to do, um, to be, um, you know, not the worst. So I think that covers COVID. Um, probably the next thing that is of importance to all of you is the governor's um, budget proposal. And of course, this is just a roadmap. We don't, um, you know, we don't, 
look at everything that the governor proposes and say, hey, we're going to do all of that. It's his proposal. And then we come up with ideas in the House and the Senate comes up with ideas. And somewhere in the middle, we meet and we um, pass a budget that we hope works for um, all of the um, citizens of the Commonwealth and all of our small businesses and even our larger businesses. But um, I would like to touch upon the governor's proposal for an increase in the PIT from 3.07 to 4.49. We have one of the lowest PITs in the United States. And the idea that, and it hasn't been raised for quite some time, and the idea that we will be able to pass a budget with one-time fixes, taking money from you know, the recycling fund or using money from the tobacco settlement that um, is supposed to use, be used for um, you know, um, education. And um, we've been doing this year after year. I'm in my fourth budget? fourth budget going on my yeah my fifth budget and I just see us not year after year not even talking about recurring sustaining revenue so we if we're going to get out of this and I heard a report from Reuters that said it's going to take our country approximately six years to recover financially from this pandemic so we are going to need to um generate recurring sustaining revenue and in his budget the governor in, on top of the PIT increase also um, mentions a severance tax to um, fund the get Pennsylvania back to work plan. He talks about um, generating revenue from the legalization of adult recreational cannabis, which over 70% of Pennsylvanians um, agree with. And um, we've seen our partners in New York and New Jersey pass the legalization. Um, so we are, we have to look at these avenues to generate revenue. And um, having a low PIT, I'm seeing a, um, I'm seeing a, uh, a comment that says having a low PIT is something to brag about. It is something to brag about, absolutely, that we can keep our bottom line down. And so if we were to raise the PIT, we would see overall 67% of Pennsylvanians would get a tax cut or see their taxes stay the same. So we're really looking at an increase to people who make $85,000 or more a year. So 40% of taxpayers will see an income tax cut. Increases um, allowances for tax, for tax forgiveness, $15,000 for single filers, $30,000 for married filers, and $10,000 allowance for each dependent. And filers with incomes at or below these thresholds will receive 100% forgiveness. So that's more money, that's more money in people's pockets. And as we know, people who make, um, you know, 40, 50, 30, $25,000 a year, um, people who work paycheck to paycheck, they go out and spend that money. If they get you know, tax forgiveness and they have a couple thousand dollars left, they're gonna go out and buy their children clothing or they're maybe gonna buy a new washer and dryer or maybe get that you know, car they've been wanting to get. So putting money in people's pockets through this tax forgiveness really does boost our economy and it helps um, actually it gives people a wage increase by letting them hold on to more of their money. So for an example, um, two, a family with two children making less than $84,000 a year would receive a tax cut, while a family of four making $50,000 um, or less will have their taxes eliminated. And it certainly is a boost um, that we need to our economy and to people who struggle and work 40 hours a week and still cannot pay their bills at the end of the week. Um, other things the governor is talking about is historic investments in schools and fair funding formula. Um, he wants to invest more than $1.3 billion in basic education funding, as Representative Brown spoke about. Um, the investment would direct existing state level basic education funding through the fair funding formula, and it would direct money to districts based on many factors, including student enrollment and needs and the ability of their community to fund their local schools. And um, we have 100, approximately 185 school districts that are 
severely underfunded in a Monroe County, we are one of them. And if we would fund our schools equitably, if we would push all that money into the funding formula and our schools would be equitable, we would see a property tax decrease anywhere from 18 to 20 percent because that's how much we're underfunded. So that's important. And we made an obligation to invest in, in education. And honestly, there are two things that the state constitution um, directs that we do. One of them is pass um, a budget on time. And the other one is to um, fund our schools. So I think the governor's budget is looking to do both of those things. And then we spoke about, I, I mentioned um, briefly, his, his um, severance tax. I believe the entire tax combined with the um, extraction tax or the impact fee, I'm sorry, would come to about 2.8% tax total. And um, that would be used to encourage workforce development and to fund the governor's back to work program because that tax on the, um, on the extraction of gas would bring an estimated $300 million a year or $3 billion over 10 years. And that would be, that projected income would be enough to, um, to take out bonds and to really invest. And how do we invest in jobs? We invest in our technical schools. We invest in our plumbers and our, and our um, electricians and the people of the future. I know Senator Scavello mentions quite a few times when he speaks that, you know, the generation that we really invested in to be our, you know, our, our tradesmen, those folks are now beginning, they're baby boomers, and they're now beginning to retire. So in a few years, it's going to be hard to find a licensed electrician or a licensed plumber or, um, you know, and even investing in technology. We are the country that um, invented the technology for solar panels, and yet we import 60% of them from China. So what if we, you know, invested in the Monroe Career and Technical Institute? Institute and gave them the you know the funds and the the um, the equipment that they needed and the training that their students needed to you know manufacture solar panels. Then we could start using the money that we generate from the workforce development program um, and start building and start producing warehouses and factories and and bringing good paying jobs here to Pennsylvania and keeping our talent here. And I think that's important. And I think the governor's proposal to do that through a common sense severance tax, we are one of 14 states that um, drill for frack for natural gas. And we're the only state that doesn't have a severance tax. Texas has an 8% severance tax and they fund education. We are, um, and we are behind um, Texas as second for our production of natural gas. And if we had a severance tax, it would only affect about 25% of our company, of our, um, our, our folks who use natural gas to heat their homes because 75% of the natural gas that we frack for is um, exported, out of, um, exported out of Pennsylvania. So it wouldn't be a huge increase to the people of the Commonwealth. And then another proposal of the governor and also a proposal of President Biden, and again, something that the majority of Americans do want to see is a raise in the minimum wage to $15 an hour. I know the governor proposed $12 an hour, and there has been legislation there introduced by uh, my colleague, Representative Patty Kim from Harrisburg, and it hasn't gotten much traction. Um, so I'm hoping that with a renewed focus in the federal government, that we will take up the, um, the cause of um, an increase. I know the Senate did pass an increase in the last session, but we weren't able to come to any agreement with, um, with the House. So the budget hearings are underway and we will get to some type of agreement that we hopefully can all agree on and vote and that will be the, um, the, best, um, the best course of action moving forward to, um, to increase revenues, to pay our bills, to help the people of the Commonwealth get through the rest of this pandemic. And um, I look forward to that work. Also, I just want to make one more point about um, COVID, um, the COVID vaccine and the Department of Health. Um, 
Governor Wolf formed a task force, um, a bipartisan task force from the House and the Senate. I know um, Representative Bridget Kozarowski from um, Luzerne and Lackawanna County, our House member who is a nurse is on that and they meet pretty often. And she said that they are um, discussing initiatives um, moving forward to streamline the process and make it work more efficiently than it is. And I, I have to just say that um, we, the, the communication hasn't always been the best, but we are you know, working with the governor and the Department of Health to improve that. And I think a, a month from now, we're going to be in much better shape because as we see the Johnson & Johnson um, get approved and see the efficacy of 80, 75 to 85% with one shot, um, I think that is going to instill confidence in people to come out and get the shot. I think it's going to allow us to um, set up mass vaccination sites. And I think the distribution and the communication is going to get better moving forward. I think the other um, legislators have also expressed that. So those are my thoughts on the budget. Um, talking locally, or let me just um, finish um, in Harrisburg. I have, um, as Rep Brown mentioned, when we begin a new session, our um, committees change. So I am on state government and I am the chairwoman on the subcommittee of government transparency and integrity. I'm also on gaming oversight, education, human services, and was elected by the Northeast delegation to serve as vice chair along with representative Marty Flynn, who is the chair of the Northeast delegation. So I'm looking forward to the important work that we do on all of those committees and um, looking forward to keeping you all informed, which I do um, on Tuesday mornings on Channel 13 BRC TV on Monroe Matters with Representative Maureen Madden, which you can also watch on YouTube. We cover many of the issues that are going on in Harrisburg and here at home. Um, we recently had um, RCAP money that was released, and I'm very happy to report that um, with help from DCED, the Department of Community and Economic Development, um, I was able to bring $3 million home to our community. The Y will receive $2 million um, for its project to rebuild the Y. And um, as you all know, the Y has quite a footprint in our community. Parents drop off newborn babies and toddlers so they can go to work every day. Um, buses drop off children after school. Kids ride their bikes there to play basketball. Um, seniors come there to exercise and have social programs and swim. And I have been part of the, you know, the project and I've seen the renderings and I'm really excited that um, the enthusiasm is there for the Y um, project. And I believe it is going to happen very soon that we will be able to break ground. I know they received a grant from ESSA Bank and they're working on engineering plans and we hope to get that report very soon. And um, I'm excited about that and we'll certainly keep all of you up, updated. And then the other project I'm excited about is the million dollars that um, I was able to bring home for the Monterey County Historical um, Association. And that is to build the addition um, because as you know, there's such rich history in our region and um, the Monroe County um, Historical Association does such a wonderful job of collecting that, that they have literally run out of room. So that's a project that I'm also enthusiastic about and um, and looking forward to the next step. Um, so I know that one of the questions that we are going to be getting is on, um, is on the legalization of adult recreational cannabis. So I will um, reserve my comments for then. Um, I would just like to um, just to say that I am looking forward to working with my colleagues in a bipartisan way to do what's best for our region and to do what's best for the Commonwealth. And to that end, I have um, signed on to Representative Brown's bill, which he co-sponsored with um, Representative Pam Snyder from um, the West on the Democratic side of the aisle. And um, hopefully that'll get 
that'll get some traction. And we have to have to do something. We have to get our majority, our Speaker of the House and the majority party to understand that um, this unequitable funding and this unequitable way in which our taxes are dispersed and people um, you know, have to reach into their pockets, seniors paying six to eight and $10,000 a year after they've paid off their homes is unsustainable. Um, I have also signed on to Rep Brown's bill, the first time homeowners bill. And it's a wonderful bill and it gives um, first time homeowners the opportunity to realize their dream of, you know, the American dream of owning a home. But if you can buy a home at a reasonable rate and get a reasonable interest rate, and you have the advantages of home, first time home buyers um, legislation, but your property taxes are gonna be eight or 10 or $12,000, that isn't going to work with most young people's budget. So really I'm looking forward to working with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to get something done for the people because it just isn't sustainable. And I think I have covered everything locally, legislatively, and I look forward to any questions. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, State Rep. Maureen Madden. I'd now like to please introduce State Representative Jack Rader serving the 176th Dis Legislative District. Yeah, can you, can you see me? You can't see me, can you? Uh, we can, can certainly you, hear you. Can you hear me? Okay, I tried to put the video on. Uh, well, Thank you so much for inviting me. I'll just talk. I can't see myself, but I'll just talk. Uh, in the 30 seconds I have left, because I, I'm going to try to make it brief. I do have another Zoom call right after this, uh, but thank you for inviting me. I think the most important thing we're facing right now is uh, uh, getting COVID shots in the arms of people and getting over this crisis and uh, getting businesses open. That's what we have to do. We have to focus on getting these businesses open. They don't, always, they don't want handouts all the time. They want to be open. They want to do their business. They want to be left alone. And that's what we have to focus on. Uh, the distribution task force, which has just started, which is a great thing, but the governor took almost a year before he'll work with the legislative branch on anything. So it's a little late to do that, but it's, a, it's something. When I, first, when I first went into March, when this first started happening I, in caucus, I, first thing I said to my leaders, I said, we have to get a task force or something together with the governor's office, the business leaders, the doctors, the all forms of society to work in this crisis because we have to work together to get through this. And they kind of looked at me and said, yeah, well, we'd love to do that, but the governor doesn't want to. So I think if we had started from the very beginning working together and we all buy in through the process, it would have gone a lot more smoothly and maybe we wouldn't have had some of the bumps in the road if we all worked together. So if we're starting that now, that's a great thing. It's a little late, but it's a great thing. Uh, we passed something having the National Guard help out with getting shots in the arms. We'll see where that goes. I don't know if the governor vetoed it or not, but I think it just went through the Senate. So getting over this COVID crisis, getting businesses back to work, getting everyone back to work and working together is the most important thing. Uh, I look at the budget. Well, the budget, the governor knows that's a, that there's no shot of raising taxes the way he wants to raise taxes. I've been in there for seven years. He's wanted to raise taxes almost every year. The first year he proposed something with this huge tax increase. It went nine months before we had a budget. And he knows, it's a political maneuver on his part, he knows that there's no way those kind of tax cuts are going to go. Not going to happen. Uh, if we had tax increases, uh, I, I voted for, and in fact, it started in the House, over a billion dollars worth of funding for education in the last number of years I've been in there. So it's not that we don't want to fund these programs. It's we can't raise taxes and our people are in an economic crisis during this crisis. We just can't do it. Uh, and if those if the tax increases were tied to property tax, lowering of property taxes, I would be for it, but it's not. It's just more spending. So we have to be careful about what we do with and, and how we tax our businesses when they are in a crisis. They're teetering on the edge of going out of business, and now we're going to raise taxes on them because a lot of the small businesses pay the PIP. That's how they run their their, their taxes through that. So we're going to raise taxes on them where, when they're in a crisis and how many of the are proposing now. That's a horrible idea. So we don't want to do that to those people. It's the same way with the minimum wage. You're going to drive up costs for small businesses in a crisis period. That's the worst idea I've ever heard. So we have to think about what it does. Yeah, it's great to get more money in the state, but what does it do to the people who are impacted by these raising of taxes? It's going to take jobs away. People are going to lose their jobs. It's going to close small businesses. It's going to impact our economy, not help our economy in the proper fashion. So I think it's a horrible idea. 
I don't think it has any legs at all in the House of Representatives, uh, and I would expect it to go in. So uh, I have a bill uh, for to try and help. We need to 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 get people to come out and go to, to uh, tourism areas such as ours. I have something uh, a bill going on that would uh, fund uh, something like PMBB and the, the other agencies throughout the state so they could market uh, the areas more because the state doesn't do it. Um, we, we do very limited marketing, we do a lousy job in marketing, even though exponentially you get so much more money back in, into the coffers if you market it properly. For some reason, the state refuses to do it. So I have a bill on the to go using some COVID funding to try and increase marketing, get people to come back from Pennsylvania. We have to change the mindset of, of people that they should want to go out, they should want to come, go away, come to the Poconos, participate in what we have, and we have to change the mindset uh, right now, everyone's scaring everybody to stay home. I think that's changing a little bit, but we have to change that mindset to get them to come out and, and come to our places again. Uh, election reform, uh, that's what state government's looking at that right now. I think there's some things that we have to do and, and, and we talk to the counties, they all, they all think that way. I watched the Secretary of State who didn't want to be at these hearings say that the legislators have to, have to act and have to do things, yet they criticize having those uh, hearings where we're trying to find out what we have to do to make the election better. That's what they're for. And you're supposed to have hearings to do that. So I heard the Secretary of State before she resigned say, well, uh, this is ridiculous, but yeah, we need reforms. Well, we do need reforms. We need hearings to find out what we have to do. Uh, we do have taxes on natural gas. Those are impact fees. That doesn't mean that we all can't work together with the industry to try and, and make the industry a better place uh, that they can make some money and also Put some more money back into the, the coffers. Um, I think that's all I have quickly in that. Someone asked me about Pocono Springs. Uh, last I heard was they were still interested in doing the project. It was pushed off a year or two because of, of course, the economy and we have to take a risk like that right now. So I don't know much more than that about that. Uh, I was asked about marijuana. I am not for increased drug use in our, in, in our state. I don't think we have to encourage more drug use. We already have drug issues. I don't think we have to encourage more drug use. That doesn't mean I'm not for decriminalization on that. But uh, to me, it's not a money thing. Uh, sure, you can, you can get a lot of money in the budget. Uh, okaying a lot of things are horrible for people. That doesn't mean we do it. So for me, it's not a budget issue. It's not a money issue. It's right and wrong. I don't think we need to encourage more drug use. I think that's everything I have to say. If you want to talk to me anytime, my office is 570-620-4341. And I'll be happy to talk to you. And thank you very much for inviting me. I have another Zoom call, so I'm going to have to jump off. Thanks again. Thank you, State Rep. Jack Rader and your entire team. Um, before we move on to q and I would like to now welcome Alana Roberts of PPL Electric Utilities to offer some presenting sponsor remarks. Thank you, and I will be brief so we can get on to Q&A, but on behalf of everyone at PPL Electric Utilities, I do want to thank my fellow sponsors here today, the health systems, for the important work that they're doing to fight COVID-19. I'd like to thank the elected officials for the important decisions they're making on behalf of our communities in all of Pennsylvania, and thank the Chamber of Commerce for convening forums to discuss these important topics. PBL Electric, Electric Utilities is doing what you would expect us to do, keep the lights on. Uh, we're actually getting better at that every year, and we hope you're noticing that. Um, customer satisfaction for PPL has never been higher. Our 2020 uh, number was the highest ever, and we received our ninth in a row JD Power Award for customer satisfaction. I think this is because the power doesn't go out very much and that's because we're investing in our system. Whether it be smart grid or the new infrastructure that we're replacing um, coupled with new technology, it may not be uh, visible to you, but certainly in the background is keeping the power on as well as saving customers money. And that's something that I wanna talk about in relation to COVID is customers' bills and saving customer money. We do have many assistance programs that customers are taking advantage of as they try to navigate uh, paying bills in this environment. Uh, we talk about LIHEAP a lot with our customers, but we've also got Operation Help and On Track, and in some cases have raised income guidelines for those programs to make more customers eligible. We're trying to get the word out in every way possible about how to help these customers. Uh, Rosemary and I believe Maureen mentioned that there's even some new money available for renters in their utility bills. And we're working with counties now to make sure that that funding is easy to get and 
can be um, gotten quickly. So PBL is holding a webinar uh, at 9 a.m. on March 11th. It's for elected officials and their staff, and it's to go over all of these programs so that when constituents come to them with questions about how to be able to afford their PPL bill, they are able to at least be knowledgeable about the overall programs and know who to contact to get more information. Lastly, PPL has elevated our focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion in the communities that we serve. We recently developed a mentoring program between employees and students who are learning virtually. And in some cases, they're struggling to keep up with the virtual learning and need more one-on-one -on -one assistance. So PPL being people of action are stepping up and trying to fill that void in education, as well as convening discussions between law enforcement and communities. Uh, for instance, we recently scholarshiped 10 officers uh, from Monroe County to attend the Pocono United Way Cultural Competition competency training. And I attended that as well, and it was fantastic. Lastly, two dates that I'll mention related to some of the diversity, equity, inclusion uh, initiatives at PPL. On March 2nd, we have scholarships due. Those scholarships are for women or for minority students who are looking to pursue a degree in STEM or who are currently enrolled in a technical or trade school uh, to apply for. And then on March 15th, PPL foundation grants are due. So any 501c3 nonprofit organization who is looking to do education, particularly high quality early childhood education or STEM education, as well as environmental sustainability. And now uh, with an increased focus on diversity, equity, inclusion, any or organization that is focused um, around that as a mission can apply for those funds. So again, that date is March 15th. The scholarship is March 2nd. The information could be found on pplcares.com. And certainly, as always, I am always available to uh, be your point of contact for anything that you have questions about at PPL. So thank you. Thank you so much, Alana. And thank you for keeping the power on, especially during COVID, a lot of us working remotely. And of course, thank you for your continued partnership and support. All right, so we are going to go ahead and enter into our Q&A portion of the program. Thank you so much to our legislators for taking the time to be with us. Um, we are going to try to end the program right around 1040. So we're going to get through as many questions as possible. So our first question today, um, and any uh, one of our legislators can jump in and answer this, is how do you get people on unemployment back to work? If they make more money on unemployment, then the jobs available will pay and they're not going to go back. So how do we plan on getting uh, people back to work? And any legislator is welcome to take that question. Okay, I'll take that question. So I think the best, so let me just make this comment because we're talking about the minimum wage increase. We're talking about a raise in the PIT. We're talking about how we recover from this pandemic. And if someone is making more on unemployment than they would be making at their job. I think that speaks um, to what we're paying people in this community and what people are able to earn and bring home and um, that they can stay home and feel safe and not be in the midst of the pandemic and collect unemployment. Um, we're, we're happy to be able that they were happy that they are um, able to collect and that we've been provided with those federal dollars and we've been able to get that money out to people. But if we're going to recover and put people back to work, obviously there are some businesses who have closed. So we have to invest that money in our workers. We have to invest that money in the wages. We have to invest that money in PPE and making sure that folks feel safe and they feel protected going back to work. And we really do have to, um, to uh, step up our training programs and our skills for folks so that people, you know, I hear over and over again the argument for not raising the minimum wage is, well, we don't really want people to have minimum wage jobs. We really want them to have better paying jobs. So how do we get to those better paying jobs if someone hasn't gone to college or, you know, um, isn't trained with a particular skill? We have to invest in education, we have to invest in training, and we have to give the people the skill set to go out and earn those better paying jobs. And we have to get our economy moving 
so that um, companies can afford to pay living wages and we have to incentivize them by giving them tax credits. We give tax credits in this state for families making over up to $110,000 a year to go to private schools, to go to Catholic schools. Why would we make that investment? And I believe it's a $50 million a year um, tax credit. Why wouldn't we give those types of tax credits to businesses for paying um, living wages, for training, and for incentivizing their employees to come back to work and to do better? We're, we have to move from the status quo. We cannot just keep going along with low wages, low wage jobs, and not making those important investments in education and workforce development. So those are my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. Would anyone else like to jump in and uh, offer their thoughts on that? Yeah, this is Senator Scavello. Um, first, I, I think the healthiest way, I know the healthiest way to drive up uh, the average wage is by creating jobs. And I think in, in Monroe, we've done a pretty good job of that. Um, between the three water parks, that must have been about, gosh, between 3,500 and 4,000 jobs at one time, which really then sh uh, shrinks the choices for other businesses if they have pretty much up the ante, basically, uh, if they want to uh, hire someone. I, I think business doing it is the best way. I don't think it should be us. I personally think that um, um, in Monroe anyway, there's no minimum wage jobs. If there is, there might be, somebody should be there because most, most of the jobs are over 10, 11 bucks an hour. At the, the resorts, they're paying 14, 15 bucks for a lifeguard, a young, young man or young lady. So um, we need to continue to help to create the jobs. As far as tax breaks, I, I uh, and I'm, Representative Madden mentioned it before, I have no problem with someone doubling the, uh, the ink, uh, income eligibility for uh, people on the lower scale not to pay into uh, pay state tax rather than do anything else. Our pensions now in Pennsylvania, they're starting to level out the pension contributions uh, because of the adjustments that we made. And those dollars can go to help pay for that without having to find another program to fund it. The last thing I want to see is us to grow spending. Uh, right now, we need to hold a line on spending, especially because of the, the pandemic and where, and where uh, uh, we are today because of the, the jobs that we lost over the, over the last year and a half. So we just need to continue to hold a line on spending and hopefully things will work out for us. Thank you all so much. Um, so we'll move on to our next question here. And the next question is, many houses in my neighborhood had part-time residents stay here full-time due to COVID-19. A substantial number are also registered to vote. Can we make sure that those who are registered to vote here file PA state income taxes as full-time residents? Um, good question. They, they it, it, depending on how long they're here, if they were here for six months or more, um, Otherwise, it's still considered in many cases like a vacation home. Uh, I know Florida has a rule that you have to live in the, in the state six months in one day. And I'm not sure if uh, th that would, I, I would assume that that would be the, the number. And, and frankly, that's something that we need to look into because it's a good question. I would assume that we're in that same boat, but uh, uh, we'll check it out. I know they voted here as well. Uh, there was quite a bit that were, um, that, that voted. And I'm hopeful that they didn't vote in New York as well, because that's illegal. You can't vote twice. But uh, there was a tremendous amount that uh, did get registered uh, in Monroe County. Thank you, Senator. All right. And then if no one else wants to comment on that question, we'll go ahead and enter our final question for today. And that is, what is being done to measure the effectiveness effectiveness of the programs where tax dollars are being spent? Are their results being quantitatively measured? So the question is whether or not our tax dollars are being spent and really achieving the desired result of our residents in Monroe County. I'll try to answer that. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. 
Sure. And I'm sorry, uh, Mario, and, and I'll try to be quick. And then I guess Mario wants no, to right. add to um, yeah. yeah. So, so listen, I, this is constantly what we try to do in Harrisburg and um, government is very big. And when you look at all the different agencies in government, um, you have to start to hone in on each and every piece of every line item, every responsibility, uh, return on investments. And those are the, the difficult conversations. And I believe now being in the legislature for a little bit that you, um, it's hard to change what people are used to doing and used to receiving. And um, you don't get a lot of honest answers when you ask for how you can do things better. Uh, within an agency. And um, we keep pushing those buttons, especially in appropriations. And I think you're starting to see a much more narrowed down um, research and conversations from each legislator. Um, and depending on what their focus is, just trying to hone in more to the very big government that we have uh, to say, hey, listen, we, we shouldn't need to raise taxes. Um, we should be able to be, do things better and especially with technology and everything. So how do we do things better? And that's the buttons that we just keep pushing and pushing and pushing because as you can see with the budget proposal, all it's talked about is raising taxes, raising taxes. And you know that is not really for right now, especially it's never a good time to raise taxes, but right now during a pandemic, I can't even, I can't even believe the conversation is being brought up. But you know, we have to start looking at doing things better. And even if they're difficult and uncomfortable, and that's what we're really trying to push in uh, appropriations and us as legislators. So it's a tough issue, I will tell you, because again, government is very big. Thanks, Mario. Sorry. Uh, no, no problem. No problem. You know, it's results that matter. And, and I do agree that we do to do, I think we need to do a better job in seeing what the actual results are of some of these programs. Um, I pretty much said earlier what I, my first, uh, uh, hearing would be as the um, policy chair committee, uh, majority chair policy was to look at the impact that it had on our businesses and, and our communities with COVID-19 COVID and the closures. But I, I will uh, tell you that I'll put that on my calendar as something else to look at specific programs. And if anyone out there has any questions on any specific program that they think that we should be looking at, um, let me know, email, email me or, or Facebook me or whatever, and we'll, we'll look into it. By the way, uh, pretty much most of the stuff that was said today, all three of all four of us have websites, have newsletters, and much of this information that was discussed today was, was out in our newsletters about three weeks ago. And we also have a, a, per, a personal page and we have a state page. Uh, mine is Mario, Senator Mario Scavello. And on that page, you get up to date from the day we vote, from the moment we vote for something um, or any, any information, it's, it's applied there and it's quickly there. And, as well, and we, ha we have a tremendous amount of visitors that visit the page. So the newsletter, the Facebook page, um, or just reach out to our offices because we're always there to help. Thank you very much. And, and I, I have to jump off now, but have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you, Senator, and thank you, Representative Maureen Madden, Rosemary Brown, and Jack Rader for joining us today. This will conclude today's presentations. It is all the time we have questions, or all the questions we have time for today. So thank you all for joining us. We look forward to seeing you at a chamber event very soon, either virtually or in person. Don't forget to follow us on social media and visit our website at www.poconochamber.org to stay up to date on all things chamber. Take care.